Impassable terrain, unusable weapons, time limits that never run out. Here are seven things games do that ruin our sense of immersion. It's very easy to get lost in games. One moment, you're browsing your Steam library, deciding what to play. The next, you're six hours deep into a Total War campaign, wondering what plans for the day you had that didn't involve throwing goblins at dwarfs, or throwing goblins at goblins, or any combination of the two. But there are some things that all games do that pull you out of the moment, reminding you that yes, you are still playing a game, and no, you're not a dwarf lord with a savage disregard for goblin safety. These moments exist in almost every game, and they only make sense if you put your brain in neutral and try not to think about why you can't pick up that enemy weapon or climb over that tiny pile of boxes. Some games give us good reasons why these things happen, but even then, they damage your sense of immersion, like seeing the boom mic drop into view in a TV show. And the more you think about them, the harder they are to forget. Here are seven things games do that ruin our sense of immersion. Our first entry is a classic. I'm talking about terrain that blocks the player's path. Despite being so inconsequential that any human being with at least one functioning limb would easily be able to climb it. Take the wonderful Alien Isolation, for example, a game with otherwise perfect set design. It blocks player progress with waist-high boxes that don't so much scream, you'll never get past here, as they do, here's where we store our matching luggage. I have the athleticism of an antique cupboard, and I'm pretty sure that even I could climb over that. And if I was being chased by an ape for alien designed only for killing, then I'm vaulting those boxes like a sprightly young gazelle. It's worse when the characters in-game are portrayed as being amazingly capable. They can fight looters, save lives, and operate complex devices. Just don't ask them to climb. And it's not that games should let us go anywhere we please, more that the reasons for preventing us should be more believable than this genteel tumble of containers. There's a feeling you get in games when you see an enemy with a cool weapon, and even before you've killed them, you're doing little twirls in your head, visualising how great it'll look on your character. And when you finally finish them and you go to pick it up, your sacred artefact remains glued to their hands, or it magically disappears in front of your eyes. All RPGs with random loot drops are guilty of this. You can usually see the incredible weapon you want right there in their hands, but there's still only a 3% chance you'll be able to pick it up. And then there are games like Resident Evil 4, where Leon decides that he'd rather stick with his trusty knife than, you know, pick up that handy chainsaw. There are some games that go out of their way to explain this. Metal Gear Solid, for example, tells us that all the enemy gear is DNA linked, which is why Snake can't use it. And that would be a really cool reason if it didn't sound like the kind of excuse a small child would come up with so he didn't have to share. I would let you have a slice of my apple pie, but it's, it's coded to my DNA, so uh, you'd die if you ate it, sorry. And weirdly, the one genre that goes out of its way to fix this stuff gets it wrong in a different way. Most modern FPS games let you pick up and throw down weapons like your scattering confetti. But this is something no real soldier would do, because they spend ages maintaining their weapons, and not all rounds are the same size or shape. So swapping weapons in FPS games is still wrong, just not in the way we thought. Next, we have cutscenes that make characters look more powerful than you experience as the player, or even worse, the opposite. Cutscenes that make your character look like a bumbling jackanapes. There's a great example in Brian Fury's ending in Tekken 3. Here's Brian running through bullets and fighting a tank. And here's him losing to a panda. This also happens with Grey Fox in Metal Gear Solid. There's his terrifying introduction, which makes you want to do everything except fight him, and later on you see him holding up Metal Gear Rex's foot by himself. But does that stop you beating him in a fist fight? No. The real-life equivalent of this would be a cutscene now of me presenting this video, but being far more talented and handsome than I actually am, and I've just confused myself by trying to visualise that. The Mass Effect series is full of these moments as well. When Jack is introduced in Mass Effect 2, she's powerful enough to punch out mechs. Miranda's biotic powers are off the chart, and Samara can apparently fly. But can any of them do these moves in-game? Again, no. Many modern games are amazing at letting us choose our own paths. Telltale, for example, have made a living from letting us make choices, often with disastrous results. But there are some games that let us make a choice only to immediately scream, no, not that one, what the hell do you think you're doing? There's a nice example in Batman Arkham City. When playing as Catwoman, if you decide to leave Batman to die and escape with the money, the credits will roll and the game will end. Except, you know, it doesn't. 
hang around long enough and the whole scene rewinds so you can make the non-stupid choice. There's another well-known example in Spec Ops The Line. You're given the option to drop white phosphorus bombs on your enemies, making them die a slow and agonizing death. When you do, you also discover you've killed hundreds of innocent civilians as well. The developers insist that you do have a choice here, and the other option is to stop playing the game. But that's a bit like a restaurant offering you a meal of teeth and matted hair, and then saying you can spit it out if you don't like the taste. And finally, a sneaky shout out to Persona 5. Yes, I know it's a PS4 game, but this one is just too good to ignore. Refuse to accept the opening disclaimer and you'll return to the start screen before the game has even begun. Before we talk about the next one, yes, we know games are meant to be fun, and no, nobody wants to hurtle through a 50-hour RPG with a narrative cattle prod attached to their backside. But there are some occasions where the option to take your time feels like an unusual fit. All of Mass Effect 3 embodies this trope. At the start of the game, you get the impression that the Reapers are systematically wiping out all life in the galaxy, and every second you waste costs thousands of innocent lives. But the paradox here is that you can take as long as you want to complete the so-called priority missions, and the optional side quests will expire if you do things in the wrong order. So delivering messages for a dead Asari life partner, for example, somehow becomes more important than saving the galaxy. This happens in Arkham City too. Batman, remember, is dying from infected Joker blood, and Hugo Strange is constantly reminding you about the implementation Sinister Protocol 10. But that doesn't stop you flapping around trying to get an achievement for gliding or spending hours scratching your batch in trying to solve the Riddler's puzzles. I'll save you in a moment, Gotham, right after I've collected all these lovely trophies. Next, we have one of my least favourite tropes and one that can undermine everything you've done in a game so far. I'm talking about levelled enemies. <laughs> On the face of it, there's nothing wrong with this. New areas have to challenge you. But there is something odd about completing a game, firing up the DLC, and discovering that some new, apparently innocuous mob is capable of one-shotting your legendary hero. My favourite example of this is in Morrowind. You can complete the main quest, become Nerevar Reborn, defeat a four millennia old god, then get smashed up by sewer goblins in the Tribunal DLC. Essentially, this suggests a small force of goblins could take over the entire island of Vardenfell if they just took a trip across the water. Oblivion does something even stranger. Over the course of the game, the rats and goblins gradually disappear, only to be replaced with trolls and ogres. And bandits, who were previously armed with just sticks and hope, suddenly have Daedric and Ebony weapons, which are worth a fortune. And if anything, we should be robbing them. And finally, we have the most heinous, immersion-breaking trope of them all, making you learn how to do something any functioning human being should know how to do already. Take the tactical knife add-on in Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. This lets you carry a blade in your left hand, changing the knife from a last resort weapon to a first choice. But pick up a gun without this attachment, and somehow you forget how it works. And to go back to Skyrim, yes, I know we always go back to Skyrim, one of the branches in Speechcraft lets you learn bribery. Now, I'm no criminal mastermind, but I always assumed bribery was one of the simplest forms of coercion. I mean, how complicated can it be? I have some money, would you like some? Yes, let's both move on. And there's a similar thing in Fallout 3 in which you have to learn the ability to eat human meat. This is a game, remember, in which you've eaten bears, squirrels and giant insects. And I do realise I'm trying to make a compelling case here for eating human flesh. And finally, we have my favourite example of them all. In World of Warcraft, you can't drink milk until you're level 5. It's not magical milk, it hasn't come from a demon cow, it's just milk. How can you possibly get drinking milk wrong? I can't use that. So there you are, let us know what ruins immersion in games for you, subscribe to Logitech G for more weekly shows, and hit the like button if you've experienced any of the stuff in this video. Thank you very much for watching.